In the summer of 1991, I was packing my car. I had a 1979 Chevette, and I was packing my car with everything I owned and getting ready to leave Cumberland, Maryland to go to start my master's program in St. Louis, Missouri. And at that time, though, again, I lived in Western Maryland, and I was involved in a rural church, Presbyterian church. Uh, and my job at the church was to work with the youth. And, to, and uh, I did so and, and um, got to know those people in the youth group and their parents and became very, very close. And so what happened on the night I was going to leave, they decided to have a kind of party for me and I met at the church. And I remember, among other things, and the plan was after the party, I'd hop in the car and just start driving to St. Louis all night. And I don't know if I recommend that anymore, but here we go. And it, so that was the idea. And I remember a, a lot of things going on, and you know, people said awfully nice things. But I think one thing I really remember was one of the elders named Ted, and Ted came up to me, and he said, you know, Nick, he said, I'm going to pray for you. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to pray for you. And I said, thank you, Ted. And I got in my car and drove away and started my master's program. A couple years later, I came back to visit, and I ran into Ted, and Ted says, you know, Nick, I've been praying for you every day since you, you, know, you left and now you're back. And I, and I just kind of froze in my tracks saying, really? And I didn't quite know what to do with that, but I just said, thanks. Well, flash forward to the year 2008, I go back to this church. They kind of have this, this lecture series that I do and decide to invite me in town the same crew is there. They invite you know, other churches to come in the area, bring in the hot shot to give a lecture, and so on and so forth. And so I did, and go through the weekend, and, at, and as I'm getting ready to go, there's Ted. He looks a bit a little older, and so do I. <laughs> and Ted says, you know, I'm still praying for you every day. And I was just completely humbled, and, and I, uh, I, I don't know what to do with that. You see, and, and I see my brother Tom Schwann back there, and he says that to me, too, that he prays for me every day. And, and thank you, Brother Tom. I, you know, it's just people have that prayer ministry. Maybe you have that for other people. And it's a powerful thing, and it's a thing that um, I feel we, we can't underestimate the power of, of intercessory prayer, people praying for us. And to me, what's powerful about this passage in Jesus' high priestly prayer that he picks up in John 14, 15, 16, 17, but be particularly begins to pray here in John 17. He prays for himself in, in verses 1 through 5. He prays for the disciples in verses 16 to 19. And now in verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, the 12 right here. I pray also for all those who believe in my message. That's the people here in this room. So Jesus says, I'm praying now. He prayed for us 2,000 years ago, and I believe what the, this means is that Jesus intends to continue praying for us in his ascension. So friends, somebody is praying for us and praying for you right now. And I think that I take great comfort and encouragement in knowing that of all, of all life's tribulations and trials and the things that we run into, we're not alone. Jesus is praying and John is telling us exactly what he's praying. Well, what is Jesus praying? I think we can sum it up this way, is Jesus is praying, and there's an appropriate response for us, and that is to attend to the glory of God. And it's so easy to lose track in life. It's so easy, especially you come to a place like Wheaton Graduate School, where you've got so much going on, so many things that have a glory of sorts, the, the sense of glory that comes from getting a solid A on a paper, the sense of glory of an interview that really went well, the sense of glory of just rubbing shoulders with colleagues. And, and there's lots of good things and glorious things, but there's another glory that, that we need to attend to. And as we start off this semester, I want to draw our attention to, so I want to talk about that. How do we tend to God's glory? And I think, first of all, our first answer is, well, we receive God's glory. Look with me at verse 20. 
Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also who, those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, I want to draw your attention to verse 22, where Jesus says, I have given them the glory. I have given them the glory. And you say, well, what does Jesus mean by glory? And friends, the way I read scripture is if you don't really know what it means in the New Testament, look in the Old Testament. And when we think about God's glory, we see God's glory showing up a number of times in the Old Testament. Think of Exodus 33. Moses is dealing with the people of Israel, and Moses says, you know, I don't know if I can go a step further on this exodus. This isn't working out so well. How, how are we going to do this without your presence accompanying us? And Yahweh says, well, my presence will go with you. And Moses says, okay, well, then show me your glory. And, and Yahweh says, I will. And he hides them in a rock, and the glory of the Lord passes before Moses. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. God reveals his name, reveals his glory to Moses. Now come up to 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon is dedicating the temple, praying over the temple space, consecrating the temple. This temple that David couldn't build, no, it had to be Solomon. He's building the temple, it has to be set so that the glory of God can come in and invest the temple, and it does. The glory cloud descends into the temple. Well, it wouldn't have been great if it, things just stayed that way, but you know the story. It doesn't. In Ezekiel chapter 11, right at the end of the chapter, we have this brief little passage where Ezekiel describes the glory coming up out of the temple, moving over to east of Jerusalem, and gone. And why did the glory depart the temple? Well, there's a lot of ways you can talk about it, but the bottom line is the people did not uh, honor the Spirit, uh, did not honor God, and did not allow the Spirit, God's glory, to fulfill its function. So that just simply begs the question, what is the function of the glory of God? I think Jesus answers that question right here in our passage. And look at the second part of verse 22. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me. Why? That they may be one. I have given them the Holy Spirit, God's presence, that they might be one. Now, I think we sit up and take note because I don't know... Uh, how conscious you are of the Holy Spirit. See, I have a confession to make. Uh, there's good news and bad news. I'm a Presbyterian. So the, here's the good news is I'm, I'm proud to belong to a rich theological tradition that has done a lot of thinking about redemptive history and the ways of God and, and to sit at the feet of, of a great theologian like John Calvin, who B.B. Warfield called the theologian of the Holy Spirit, along with Augustine. The bad news is this. Sometimes what's great in theory doesn't really work out so much in practice. And sometimes I wonder if in my tradition, functionally, we're more Benetarian than Trinitarian. And we, you know, we give lip service to the Holy Spirit, but we're not really quite sure what we do with him if we actually expect him to show up. Now, I'm being a little bit hard on ourselves, but here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not the third missing party of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit has to be real, has to be part of our experience. And, and the question is, how do we experience the Holy Spirit in our own lives? And I hope you do. And, and well, of course you do, because the Holy Spirit, I mean, his benefits are many. He, he is the comfort in our season of sorrow. You know, see, he is our peace in our time of tribulation. He is our light in our days of darkness. The Spirit does all these things for us. He is our companion in instances of isolation. The things, the ways that he blesses us as individuals. Glory be to God. But Jesus doesn't mention those things right here. He's talking about a corporate picture, and he's saying, although all he says about the Spirit's function is that they might be one. So the, the point here is, as far as Jesus is concerned in this particular section of his prayer, the Spirit has one function and one function only, and it's not so much for you personally, but it's for the gang, that we might be one. Which raises a question for us. Are we allowing the Spirit to work in us in such a way that it increases our oneness? 
or are we limiting and narrowing the spirit that the spirit can't really do what the spirit needs to do? You know, I don't know if you caught it in the news media, but I noticed this past fall. Remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Who's seen that movie? You remember the red sports car, the 1963 California Spider that was in that movie? That was, that was sold this past fall for about $253,000. And I, you know, I wish I'd known about it. I would put a bid on it, of course. But uh, you know, I don't know uh, who, who bought the car. But if you've seen that movie, I, I don't know, uh, you know whether you saw it many, many years ago or just recently. But there's a scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and the, the, the premise of the movie is Ferris Bueller skips school and, and has a great day in Chicagoland. And, and, and there's a scene where he goes to his friend Cameron's house, and his dad owns this hugely expensive, hugely beautiful sports car. And there's a scene where they're kind of walking around it, and Ferris is trying to talk Cameron into taking the car out for a spin. He says, no, no, Ferris, I, well, I can't do that. And, and Ferris is just kind of feeling the car and, and like looking at it and imagining what it would be like to take the car for a spin. And Cameron says, no, my dad doesn't even drive this car. He doesn't even take the car out. And, and you're watching that scene, and part of you is saying, man, man, dad doesn't even drive the car? Take the car out! You know, it's like, it just, it, this car is made to drive. And, of course, they hop in the car, and, the, you know, the rest is history. But that you see the, the, the California Spider GT uh, sitting in the, in the garage without anyone driving it. It's kind of like the Holy Spirit working in our lives without us allowing it to a fulfill its function of bringing us together if we're committed to living in isolation. What we have to do, you see, is remember that the basis of our unity is in the spirit. And that, to me, that's a powerful truth because, you know, we have certain groups that we aggregate to. You know, sometimes guys need to spend time with guys and women need to spend time with women, and that's a natural thing. And sometimes, you know, if you're in a minority culture, it's useful and helpful to share notes with other people as they negotiate majority culture, and that's a good thing. And sometimes, you know, when you find people of your theological tradition, you can hang out with people of your theological tradition, and that can be an encouraging thing. And sometimes, too, you know, if, if you're in the PsyD program, you'll hang out with other PsyD people. Or if you're in the exegesis program, you'll hang out with the other exegesis people. This is natural in life. That they're called affinity groups. However, the problem is if all your if our affinity groups become silos, and if our affinity groups become barriers where the the men are just hanging out with the men and the women are just hanging out with the women, and the and you're only hanging out with people in your program without being aware of the possibility that God might be, and through the Holy Spirit, wanting to bring you together to break down silos to help you realize fellowship in a way that you've never realized it for before because you're meeting people you otherwise wouldn't have been able to meet, then shame on us. Because our unity is not based on our affinity groups. Our unity is based on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit bonding us together. So that's the one thing I think that God wants to say is that, listen, we need to uh, respond to him uh, we also need to uh, realize God's glory in our own midst. Let me take you to verse 21. I have given them the glory that you've given me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I in them, you and me. When God calls us to this unity, you say, well, what's this unity about? What's, what's the bar for this unity? And Jesus makes that very clear. The bar is the same unity shared by the members of the Trinity. And that's a tall order. So when we're talking about God bringing this supernatural unity in our midst, there's, there's no ceiling to this. But God says, this is the way I realize my glory in your midst. This is how I have my glory days. And he makes this perfectly clear, not just here, but think back to John 15. John 15, verse 7. Jesus says this, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, 
ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we realize God's glory in our midst when we remain in him, and Christ, through the Spirit, remains in us. The mystical indwelling, our relationship with God, will generate fruit, will generate a renewed humanity that brings glory to God, and that is how God is glorified. God has a glorious plan for us, and that begins not with anything that you do by yourself, but by God working in you and you dwelling in God. Well, how exactly does this work? Jesus, I think, explains this starting in verse 25 of chapter 17. Righteous Father, he says, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that uh, you have sent me. I have uh, made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and get this, and that I myself might be in them. Did you catch that? Jesus says, and if you want me to be in you and you in me, here's what has to happen. Uh, you, need to know, you need to know my love, and, and I will continue to make you known um, through the word uh, and through the spirit. Two points here. Jesus has made uh, himself known to us. How has he made himself known through us? As I said, through the word. When you want to say, how do I, when you say to yourself, how do I know who God is? We have the answer right here. God has given us his once for all deposit, his revelation, and in terms of meeting God and getting to know God, we have it right here. And I think most of us sitting here are aware of that and know that. But there's something else Jesus says. He says, I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known. And here, I think, we come back to the Spirit. Because, yes, God has revealed himself once for all in the pages of our Scripture, but he also says, and I continue to make you know why, by creating new uh, texts from the Bible. Is there going to be a book of hesitations that we should get ready for? No, it's that the Spirit uh, will continue to reveal through Scripture to us, and that's important because if we just read the Bible apart from the Spirit, you might as well be reading the phone book. And I know that because I've tried that many days in my life. Uh, it, it's, 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 it goes something like this, where you open up your Bible and it becomes a checklist. You know, I've started the coffee, started the laundry, now I've got to do the Bible reading. And you get in and you get out, and I think that I've done my duty, but the question is, oh, yes, but have I met with the Spirit? Richard Foster puts it this way. He says, you know, when it comes to reading Scripture, uh, you know, three things need to happen. Uh, we need to read Scripture attentively, we need to read Scripture expectantly, and we need to re read Scripture humbly. And so uh, sometimes, sometimes, as a New Testament scholar, I'll tell you, I'll read Scripture and I don't expect the Spirit to be there. And I say that to my shame. You know how cold it was a couple weeks ago. Uh, my family and I decided to, uh, for, for them to pick me up, we were doing a kind of car swap deal where I had to be dropped off here on campus and they were going to pick me up later. Oh, and it wasn't that cold, maybe 10, 10 degrees below zero, something warm like that. And uh, I said, well, I'll meet you outside. And, and, and I thought, I said, I'll meet you outside the SRC, but something else was thought on the other end. I said, I'll meet you out right at 1 o'clock because I will be outside. And I was right outside, and it was 1 o'clock, and it was 1.03, and it was 1.06, and uh, 1.07, I'm texting, where are you? <laughs> and uh, she said, where are you? And I said, I'm at the SRC. And she said, well, I thought you told me the BGC. And, and so I get in the car at 1.11, and she says, are you cold? And I said, no. <laughs> 
But I, you could believe you, me, after about 102, uh, every car I see, I've just got my eyes focused on, is that the car? Is that the car? Is that the car? I am waiting expectantly, my friends. And that's the way we should be reading scripture. Is, is when we open up the pages, we're just looking for God and waiting for him to be there. And if that's not the way it is, then just close and start again. Last point. Okay, we need to respond to God. Um, and and here's, how, here's how this works. Verse 24, Father, I want you... Uh, uh, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. I want you, those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. Two parts. I want those you give me to be with me. In the Greek, it's ego eimi to be with the great I am in God's presence. And where does God's presence dwell? In the temple. Uh, Jesus says, I want them to be in that place where the divine presence dwells. That's where I am. And they're going to see my glory. Jesus talks about his glory earlier and talks about the glory of the Father in John chapter 12, and it's interesting because in John chapter 12, in verse 20, there were some Greeks who went up to worship at the feast, and they come up to Philip and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And then they bring this back to Jesus, and then in a complete non sequitur, in verse 23, Jesus says, Oh, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And as we're reading John, we go, What? How does that work? These Greeks, they want to see Jesus, and now Jesus is talking about his death, and he's, and he's talking about a kernel of wheat falling to the ground, and he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. And what does all this have to do with seeing Jesus? Well, it has everything in the world to do with seeing Jesus, because John 17 answers John chapter 12. I want them to see me exalted and lifted up, and when Jesus talks about the Son of Man being exalted and lifted up, uh, he's talking about being crucified. But he's also talking about a very famous scene back in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah has a vision of the Lord, high and exalted and lifted up. And he sees the glory of the Lord and he falls down. And he could, Because what else do you do when you've met God? You fall down and worship in the Lord's presence. Jesus says, I think in so many words, when Isaiah walked in the temple, he saw me exalted on the cross. Personally, I believe that's exactly what went on. Isaiah's vision of God was in Jesus Christ crucified, and the result was worship. And how do we respond to this crucified Jesus? We respond together by seeing him and giving our lives to him. You see, friends, God called us together sovereignly for a reason. We're not here by accident together. The person you're sitting next to, the people uh, you're in class with, the professors that you have, the staff you interact with, God has a plan to achieve his glory. He wants us to, uh, respond, uh, to respond to him. He, he wants us uh, to uh, have the glory realized and we're, as we worship him through the power of the Spirit, we will see Jesus by the power of the Spirit, Jesus Christ crucified, and that will transform our lives. But we have to have our lives open to it. Let's pray. Father, I just want to confess that uh, you have sent the Spirit, and I have not given the Spirit the space that he needs to work in my life. Father, I confess, too, the times where I have functionally acted like a secular humanist who uh, doesn't have uh, time and doesn't have mental space for these divine interruptions. But, Father, as we kick off this semester and a time of fresh start, we pray that we would be spirit-led, spirit-driven, spirit-respondent people. And the Spirit's goal for all of us 
is to achieve this glory by achieving this unity, even in, among this midst of brothers and sisters. We pray that you have your, your way with us, and we give you, per, you permission to overrule our sinful autonomy so that you might be glorified. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.